morning. How's everybody doing today? Looks like we got a pretty good crowd out there in the virtual audience today. Go ahead and check in and tell me hello. Who's here in the audience? By the way, while I'm waiting for you to check in, I want to say thank you to all of you who uh, participated in the live stream, uh, the YouTube live stream yesterday and supported my friend Michael Yur. Um, he's been doing this show probably about five or six years. I helped him start it, actually, uh, five or six years ago, and he's been doing it. And um, I just wanted to go in and show some, por some support for him yesterday. So I appreciate each and every one of you that logged into that live stream broadcast. I'll be looking for that extra credit to appear in your uh, extra credit column sometime later on today. Holy cow! Ron Muse, is that really you stopping back in to say hello? I cannot believe it. It is great to see you, man. Thanks for coming back. Folks, Ron Muse was uh, uh, a student from last semester. I usually have some students stop in uh, once or twice a semester, and uh, it's good to see you again. Thanks for coming, man. Uh, we're doing the same thing we always do. He was, uh, you were a, a, a police officer in Haiti, I think you said, or Jamaica was it back in the day. Um, and so he, he brought in a really nifty uh, ex-military police officer perspective to class last semester. Uh, it's good to see you. Uh, hi, Sandra, Andrew Nicole, Imani, good to see you. Melody Webb, good to see you. Sarah King. Fantastic. I want to thank everybody for stopping in today. So we're talking about memory today. Uh, chapter 7, the cognitive perspective. I don't know if you remember that from last semester, Ron Muse. Hi, Jade. Um, but uh, we're talking about the information processing perspective. I suggested to you that the computer was the single most important technological invention of the 20th century. Uh, when it comes to the cognitive perspective. The invention of a computer uh, suggested to uh, people that it was not only possible, but probable that the human being was an information processing machine with a set of instructions inside, uh, an operating system, if you will, that dis described how that human being that human computer processed information. So the cognitive perspective is the branch of psychology that's interested in understanding the operating instructions that are in your mind. That is to say, what are the patterns, habits, and rules that you use to process information? If you remember on Tuesday, we were talking about the Atkinson Shipman three box model of memory. I suggested to you that you should think about uh, memory is being processed in three ways, the short-term, the sensory memory, the short-term memory, and a long-term memory. All right, so we sort of talked about the structure of a memory, and I said, talk to you about what happened in each of these three memory stores. Remember, the sensory memory was sort of a pre-conscious filter that you used to decide what you were going to pay attention to. Your short-term memory was where you rehearse information that's in your conscious awareness, and depending upon how you rehearse that information, it may or may not be encoded in your long-term memory. So today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, your memory stores and a less than perfect memory. But let's first talk about last night or Tuesday night's uh, webinar. If you came to Tuesday night's webinar, I taught you the method of location, which is a memory improvement technique that uses the strength of your brain, okay? Now, uh, good retrieval cues use the brain strength to improve memory. One of the things that I find is a lot of people say, I have a good memory, I have a poor memory, as if you're either born with one or another. Actually, you're not. Memory is an ability. And just like any other ability, like playing the piano, playing soccer, or learning how to do math calculations, it is a learned ability. And so what you need to do is you need to practice that faculty. You need to practice your memory ability, just like you practice any other ability. And if you do, you can have what they call good memory. But it all depends upon how you 
uh, use the machinery that you've got. Now, if you look right underneath me, <clears throat> uh, I'd sort of show you some of the parts of the brain. Now, uh, and if you use the strengths and what these parts of the brains like to do, it will supercharge your memory process. So the hippocampus is responsible for cons consolidating memory, making memory new memories in your brain. And the hippocampus is also responsible for location, locating you in space. Now that's attached to your amygdala, <clears throat> which is important for uh, what we'll call classical conditioning or implicit memory, and also fear in emotional responses. All right, your temporal lobe is where memories are stored, and then your prefrontal cortex is where your working memory is. Now, here's the thing. Good retrieval cues use the brain's strengths to improve memory. Now, your brain likes location, and your brain likes vivid images that have emotions. Those are sort of the three things that your brain likes. And so when you try to store things, if you can use those three qualities, you can improve these memory traces that you're trying to stick in your brain. How many of you have ever heard, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally? If you know what that is, please type in the chat bar. Let me know what uh, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally is. What does that stand for? You know that's a, a phrase that means something. Go ahead and let me know what that is. Does everybody, anybody know every good boy does fine? If you know what that is, type that in the chat bar, okay? Now, what uh, these are, these are examples of mnemonics, which is where you use the power of schema associations we talked about on Tuesday in, uh, in the temporal lobe. So we have all of these memories in our temporal lobe, and if you want to get a memory into your brain, you need to attach it to other memories that are already there. Melody knows it's the order of operations. Please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. Tells you how you should do your operations in math. Parentheses, exponents, multiply, divide, add, and subtract. Fantastic. And every good boy does fine if nobody knows that. That is the uh, notes on the treble clef. There you go, musical staff. Every good boy does fine. And then the spaces in between the lines are face. Right? I don't know if you know face as well. The bass clef chords, fantastic. Now, so what you do is you can use these mnemonics and schemas that are in your brain so you can get a funny image. Please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, that's stuck in your brain. And that will help you learn this new piece of information. So mnemonics use the power of schema associations in the temporal lobe. Remember I suggested to you that there are a bunch of associations you have with the word circus. In fact, I showed it in class on Tuesday. I said the word circus and you all uh, spouted out the same basic words. We all know what goes with a circus. So if you can create an image in your head and stick it there, then you can attach something to that. All cars eat gas. Whoa, what's all cars eat gas? Is that another part of the uh, trouble clef? Melody, I haven't heard that when you got me there. Now, here's the deal. Your temporal lobe, where you store things. Remember, you've got a fusiform uh, area in your, in your uh, temporal lobe that just remembers what faces look like. Use that as a clue. Your temporal lobe loves images and pictures more than it loves, more than it loves words. Words were invented less than 5,000 years ago. The brain wasn't evolved, didn't evolve places to remember words. <clears throat> Instead, the brain remembers images and pictures. So if you want to remember something, use visual imagery. Uh, somebody who was in class uh, Thursday night, can you tell me what the third and fourth words that I taught you were? Can anybody use a visual image? If you were in my webinar on Tuesday night, and I think a couple of you were, think back. Remember the second, uh, the second object in your house, the third and fourth words. Can anybody remember what those words were? I don't bet any of you could type those two words. I know, I'm thinking of it right now. All right, so visual imagery. 
And then, like I said, the method of location. What I showed you on Tuesday night, what I'm going to show you tonight, is how to create a path in your mind in a location that you know. And close your eyes and you can walk along that path and see objects that you store there. Holy cow, Andrea and Nicole, chicken and apple. Very good. I can't believe you know that. Very impressive. Um, did you surprise yourself when you were able to remember that, Andre and Nicole? And so to improve your memory, what you need to do are use mnemonics. Use visual imagery and use location. And I'm going to talk about that again tonight in webinar. So please come if you haven't come. I'm telling you, this is a powerful memory trick. Now, the other thing is, if you are going to uh, remember something, you really want to stick something in your long-term memory, you have to think about it more than once. This fellow named Hermann Ebbinghaus, a German psychologist in 1900, uh, studied these things called uh, um, um, nonsense syllables that he would make up. And he would study them till he remembered them perfectly. And then he would wait for lengths of time to see how slowly he lost the memories that he had. And what he found was that when you try to learn something new, you forget 50% of it within the first hour. So let's say I gave you uh, a list of psychology words to study, definitions, and you studied them until you could remember them perfectly on an immediate test of recall where you could flip the page over and try to tell me what the words were. If you can do that, you're going to lose what you learn you're going to lose 50% of that within the first hour. Now, if you, uh, I can't tell you how many times I have students come up to me after a test and they say, Dr. Roddenberry, I knew everything. I studied so hard. I looked at my notes and I looked at my notes. And then when I got into the test, I forgot half of what uh, was on the test and I made a 50. What's wrong with my memory? Nothing's wrong with your memory. That's what happens the first time you learn something and learn it perfectly, and then stop thinking about it, if you'll wait an hour, you're going to lose 50%. That's an average. Now, the thing is, uh, Melody, that memory trick that I taught you uh, on Tuesday night, that's going to blow away that 50% loss. And I guarantee you, if I asked Andre and Nicole to write down the 32 words I taught you, I'll bet you Andre and Nicole right now would probably be able to write down 25 or 26 of those words pretty easily, right? What's the best way to study? Erica, come to the webinar tonight at 8 o'clock. That's exactly what I'm going to talk about. Uh, though, well, but let me go on. Uh, I will answer that question a little bit. So here's the deal. If you are going to study, what you need to do is study multiple times. Every time you study some material, you are consolidating it. So every time you look at your notes and bring it into your conscious awareness, you are consolidating or reconsolidating that memory. And so every time you bring it into your conscious awareness and rehearse it, you strengthen that memory a little bit. So the deal is study multiple times instead of just one time, Dierica. Now, I don't mean you necessarily have to study more. Let's say you're going to spend three hours studying for a math test or a science test or a psychology test. If you're going to study three hours, rather than studying three hours for one, uh, one entire day, instead, study three times for one hour. Does that make sense, Erica? So instead of, if you have an exam on Monday, instead of studying three hours on Sunday, study one hour on Saturday. Friday, one hour on Saturday, and one hour on Sunday. Every time you bring that information back into your awareness after letting it go, you strengthen that memory. And this is actually known as the distributed practice effect. The distributed practice effect. If you budget how much time you're going to study and then break that study time up into multiple episodes. It's 7 p.m. tonight. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. So here's the deal. What I want you to do is use mnemonics. People that learn all the bones or all the muscles. Anybody ever goes to medical school 
will tell you about all the tricks and mnemonics and word games they use to store memories. Use visual imagery, imagine pictures of things rather than words. And this is what a lot of maybe even the, uh, your, your doctors and other people who studied a lot of things and memorized a lot of things don't realize. Use location, and that's what I'm going to do. Find a path and put things in that path in your mind. And when you go back along that path, you'll see those things waiting for you. So instead of doing what I, and I mentioned this on, uh, I mentioned this on Tuesday when I talked about the quality of rehearsal. While stuff's in your short-term memory, you're rehearsing it. The rehearsal style determines how well the memory trace will be. So what you want to do is use these things where you elaborate the rehearsal, where you relate the information to other stuff that's already in your brain. This elaborative rehearsal, these elaborative rehearsal strategies will improve the strength of your memory trace. And again, studying multiple times instead of one time. All right. <clears throat> now, here's the weird thing. Um, I should actually have gone to this, this uh, page first. All right. Now, how do one of the things, uh, questions that you might ask is, is memory one thing or is memory a bunch of different things? So you folks all remember how to use a cell phone. All of you remember how to walk. And all of you remember who the first president of the United States is. If you think about it, knowing how to walk, right, knowing how to walk, um, knowing um, uh, how to use a phone and knowing uh, George Washington um, are all three memories, memories. And where are memories stored in your brain? Can you teach? No. Uh, photo, photo, uh, photographic, those people who have uh, a perfect memory, those people are born. And you know, the crazy thing is uh, people with photographic memory, Dierica, a, they're not any smarter than you. In fact, some of them aren't going to do as well intellectually as you are. And number two, a lot of times their memories get in the way of one another. It's important to actually forget one thing so that you can learn another. Sometimes if you learn two things, one can sort of uh, confuse your ability to, to see the other. In fact, that's what we would call these uh, retrograde and anterograde uh, memory effects. All right, now, so is memory one thing or many things? And if it's many things, remember we have the theory of the modular brain, where are these different memories processed? Now, uh, what, what I will tell you is that we know for a fact that even though walking is a memory, that using a cell phone is a memory, that being afraid of uh, a white furry rat is a memory, that knowing who George Washington is a memory, these are different kinds of memories and they are stored in different parts of the brain. If you remember from chapter two, I talked to you about lesioning studies and uh, as a way to learn about different parts of the brain and what they do. And we've learned an awful lot about memory and the fact that memory is modular from lesioning studies. Humans can remember where the keys are on a keyboard when typing, but can't recall them like on a blank sheet. I would call that context-dependent. Um, they're context-dependent memory, Gloria. So you've got the right context. It seems to pull the memory out. I don't know if you folks have ever had that. If you're ever having trouble on a test and you're trying to remember something, Go back and imagine yourself sitting in the room that you were studying in when you learned the material. Sometimes if you go back to that original context, you will be able to recall the memory. So having your hands on a keyboard, uh, you are in the right context. But more importantly, Gloria, and I'm going to talk about that, I would argue that being your memory for where the keys on a keyboard are, are uh, what we would call procedural memories. It's muscle memory in your fingers. It would actually be hard for you to tell me how to ride a bike. 
even though you remember how to ride a bike, you don't think about it. You just sort of do it. Exactly. Similar to how you know song lyrics when you hear the music but can't recall them without. That's what we would call um, a, a contextual effect. Absolutely. Absolutely. We call that the term that your book is going to use, that psychologists use, is what we call state-dependent memory. Have you folks ever heard of state-dependent memory? I remember uh, when I was a young student, my friends would tell me that's why you need to be, you know, if you're going to uh, drink alcohol when you study, you should drink alcohol before the test. That's a horrible idea. That's not what we're talking about, state-dependent memory or context-dependent memory. What I'm talking about is sending your back self back to the state in which you learned the material. So if you learn the material sitting at your kitchen table, put yourself back in that state and it will help you pull the material back up. Okay, but how do we learn that memories are multiple things? We learn them from brain imagery. Now, your book talks about the case of a fellow named H.M., Henry Meliason. Back in the days of case studies, a lot of times in case studies, they'll use your initials uh, to protect your privacy. But Henry Meliason, is, uh, his case is gigantic in the field of uh, psychology, so everybody knows who he is. But H.M. Uh, was a young man uh, back in the, <clears throat> in the 50s that had to have his hippocampus removed because he was having seizures. So uh, a lot of times, if you have severe seizures that don't respond to medicine, they will, uh, they may elect to do brain surgery. Now, when you take out parts of the brain, uh, it causes deficits. And in the case of HM, they took out his hippocampus. And the weird thing about Henry Meliason was, he could remember everything he learned before the surgery, but he was never able to learn anything new. Anything new. Yes, Sarah, uh, uh, having the same drink, uh, uh, chewing the same gum, anything that puts you back in the state that you were when you learned the material will serve as a memory cue. It's just like I don't know if any of you, if you're ever asked your uh, social security, the last four digits of your social security number, you can't just remember your last four. You actually have to go through the entire social security number. And when you get to the last four, they're there waiting for you. You're inducing a state. So yes, Sarah, any of these ways that bring you back to the state in which you use that material is going to improve. All right. Now, the weird was <clears throat> the weird thing was is Henry Meliason suffered from what we call anterograde amnesia. He was not able to create any new memories, but everything before the uh, uh, surgery uh, was still intact. So that's when we learned that the hippocampus processes processes uh, uh, memories, but they are not stored there. That's where we learned that. Memories are processed in the hippocampus, but they don't stay there, okay? Oh, weird. William remembers the last four, but not the beginning. Not me, buddy. I have to actually sit there and do the numbers. That's weird how you can remember that. How about this? When somebody asks you your phone number, do any of you have to dial your number in order to remember it or think about your phone to remember your phone number. For me, a lot of times I have to imagine myself dialing it. Or if you ask me what my father's number is or what my wife's number is or what my uh, two sons' phone numbers, I actually have to imagine dialing them before those things will pop back into my memory. Wow, you folks are really interested in this state, this idea of state-dependent memory. It is really, really important. So. Create a state when you're studying that material. Maybe chew that gum. Have your, uh, your favorite drink when you study. And use that when you go into the exam to get this state-dependent effect. Uh, I forget my debit pen all the time, but it's muscle memory. Yes, yes, yes. So let's get back to the different parts 
Okay, for phone passcode. All right, cool. You all folk, you folks all seem to know that we have these memories that we aren't called into conscious awareness. That brings up a good point, and I'm talking about that on this chart, so let me talk about it. You see over here where we have explicit and implicit memory? Explicit memory is something that you can bring into your conscious awareness. So if I ask you what your debit pen number is, and you can tell me, that's an explicit memory. But if you just stick your card in the machine and your fingers go up and you type, that's what we would call implicit memory. And what you folks are talking about with your PIN number and your phone passcode is that you have these things stored as implicit memories, right? Now, uh, and you notice that sometimes when you actually ask to pull it up, you have trouble pulling it up into your conscious awareness. You have to think about the behavior for it to come. That's because it's an implicit memory. It's a procedural memory that's studied, that's stored in your cerebellum. If you, you remember how to walk, you remember how to dial a phone, you remember how to ride a bicycle, you have remembered how to feed yourself with a fork. These are all memories, but they are what we call procedural memories. And they're controlled by your cerebellum that learns to integrate uh, motor movements together. This is one of the most complex parts of the brain, and it has all these thin sheets uh, of neurons that lay on top of one another that coordinate the movement of different body parts. So the cerebellum is very important for what we would call procedural memory. And you know what? A lot of people who maybe get a knock on the head and develop amnesia because they bump their head, they will still remember how to walk, how to talk, how to use a phone, but they may not even be able to remember their name or where they were last Tuesday. So we know procedural memories are different uh, from explicit memories. Now, uh, do you folks remember when we talked about classical conditioning and I suggested to you that little Albert uh, learned to be afraid of white rats and white furry things and then he generalized that fear to all white furry things? Yes, if you did, that was stored, that memory is controlled by his amygdala, his amygdala, right? So what they found, and uh, you don't do this into humans, humans, but in experimental studies with uh, 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 monkeys, when you destroy the amygdala, these animals lose their innate fears of predators and these basic learned responses that we have. So we know that the amygdala is responsible for fear learning in classical conditioning learned fear, okay? So your cerebellum and your amygdala are responsible for what we would call implicit memories. You don't need to think about the, little Albert doesn't need to remember the time that he was scared by the white rat. He just knows he's afraid of them, right? Uh, you don't have to think about how to walk or ride a bike. You just engage in the behavior. Those things are what we call implicit memories, memories that occur below the level of conscious awareness. <clears throat> now, what we found is that people who have damage to their uh, cerebral cortex lose their ability for conscious memories, but still have a lot of these implicit abilities left, right? So, People who uh, suffer from brain damage. Now, if you remove parts of the temporal lobe, you will damage a person's memory for events that happened before the accident. So let me go to this one right here. You see retrograde amnesia. In retrograde amnesia, you can learn new information, but you forgot some things that happened in your past. Retrograde amnesia occurs when you have damage to your temporal lobe and your prefront and your frontal lobe because your temporal lobe is where you're going to store all the memories for things that have happened to you including faces that you've met right and your frontal lobe is where you're going to remember a lot of self memories what you like what kind of person you are what your personality is like okay so that's going to be your frontal lobe so the weird thing is if you have damage to these parts of your brain, 
You may lose your memory for faces and friends and events, but you will still have learned fear responses and you will still be able to engage in uh, behaviors of one type or another. Now, uh, I don't know if you folks have ever heard of Alzheimer's disease. Anybody ever heard of Alzheimer's disease? And can anybody tell me uh, uh, what is the major characteristic of Alzheimer's disease? What's the major characteristic? Okay, the major characteristic of Alzheimer's disease is severe dementia. Yes, memory loss. Absolutely, right? So, what happens in Alzheimer's disease is you have, you know what? You have these plaques and tangles. These plaques and tangles, oh my goodness, these plaques and tangles that occur in your neurons that cause your neurons to start dying. And when these neurons start dying, uh, they cause memory loss. And the weird thing is with Alzheimer's is the memory loss that the neurons start dying up in the frontal lobe and in the temporal lobe. And the neurons in the back of the brain and the cerebellum and deep in the middle of the brain die last. So what you're going to notice is that people who have uh, dementia, uh, who, the, who develop uh, schizophrenia, the first thing that's going to happen is they're going to start forgetting things that happened to them. And they're going to start, for, they're going to start forgetting uh, events that happened to them. Uh, and they're going to, their personality is going to start changing. And then what's going to occur later is they're going to start to lose their ability to engage in basic abilities, like using the phone, like using the toaster, as these parts of the brain towards the rear part of the brain begin dying. And so this is sort of if, you'll, if you've ever talked to anybody who's had a loved one that suffered through schizophrenia, what you're going to notice is that they start forgetting some memories before they forget other memories. You know what? I seem to have lost a couple of slides, and I don't know why I have lost these slides. But I'm going to go back and, uh, hmm, that is so bizarre. Give me just a second, if you could. My slide deck is gone funky. So it's going to go all black for a minute. And then I'm going to have to add some files from fall of 21. Do, 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 do. This is annoying. I just realized. That's why my lecture got a little disrupted there for a minute. I was just realizing that I was missing a slide I needed to go over. Oh, excuse me. All right. So my grandmother still has vivid memories of her childhood with struggles with her short term. You know, that's interesting. William Cray, when we talk about the normal progression of age-related cognitive deficits, we typically talk about uh, the difference between uh, crystallized and fluid intelligence. What you're going to find is that people, as they get older, their memory for things, what they know, they definitely know. And so the memory that your grandmother's been talking about all her life, that's never going to go away. What's going to happen as we get older is your ability for creating new memories and for thinking flexibly and thinking quickly are going to go away. So one of the things that you're going to notice as you get older is your memory for things that happened 50 years ago are still going to be crystal clear, but you're not going to think as fast. You're not going to be as good a problem solver. And your what we call your fluid intelligence is going to decline. So your crystallized intelligence stays the same. Your knowledge stays the same as you get older, but your ability to think flexibly quickly and to form new uh, uh, creative memories is going to decline severely as you get older. That's a great point to bring up. That's a really good point to bring up. 
All right. Now, so here's the deal. Uh, this is the slide I wanted to show you. Um, this graphic will help you sort of understand the different types of memory in the long-term storage and the subtypes. So we typically differentiate between explicit memory, which is memories that we think about who the first president of the United States was, what happened to your grandmother in her childhood, William Cray, uh, the fact that Stacy McCarver came to my nine-year-old birthday and I was so in love with her, Boom. All of these are what we call explicit memories, memories that you have to bring up into your conscious awareness. And we're going to differentiate those from what we will call implicit memories, which are uh, behavior memories, muscle memories, if you will. Now, remember, I suggested to you that there are two kinds of muscle memories. There's what we would call procedural memories, straight up knowledge for how to do behaviors. And then there are these learned classical condition associations that you have. So if you remember in last week's chapter six homework assignment, I wanted you to tell me what sort of classical conditioning technique you would use to make sure that Devin always liked coming to therapy. And a lot of you correctly uh, suggested that you should have candy or stuffed animals in the room always. So whenever uh, Devin came, he would have a positive emotional experience the moment he walked in the door. Oh, I'm in the door and there's a piece of candy. Absolutely. This is sort of a memory, if you will, this classically conditioned association is below the level of awareness, but it's still a memory. And so we'll talk about uh, classical conditioning and procedural memory as two forms of what we call implicit memories. Now, I want to step back for just a second and talk about our explicit memories. We found sort of the weird thing is because some people have uh, different, when people have amnesia, they typically lose one type of memory that we sort of suggested that maybe there's two different kinds of memory stores. Now, a lot of people who suffer from uh, knocks on the head will forget what happened to them for the last week or maybe the last month. And typically, this forgetting doesn't last forever. But the person who who has who who uh, gets a concussion and forgets what happened to them last week will still know what the name for a telephone is. They will still be able to name all of the barnyard animals that they've ever learned about in kindergarten. They'll still be able to identify that's red, that's blue, that's green. So they'll still have some memories, but they won't have been able to remember what happened to them. So we know that there are what we would call episodic memories and semantic memories. And these are both kinds of explicit memories. They require you to, they require conscious effort to be verbally, to be described, right? And an episodic memory is a memory for something that happened to you, all right? A semantic memory is a memory for a concept. Let me give you the example. <clears throat> um, a tomato is a fruit, not a vegetable. Maybe you didn't know that, but now you do. A tomato is a fruit, just like an orange or an apple. It is not like, uh, it is not like uh, a, a green bean or a potato. It's not a vegetable. It's a fruit. That's a semantic memory that you now have in your brain. The fact that you had tomatoes on your salad for lunch yesterday, that you had tomatoes for lunch yesterday, is an episodic memory, okay? Now, you can remember what a tomato is without remembering that you had tomatoes yesterday for lunch. Do you see that? So one of them is an episodic memory and one of them is a semantic memory. Wow, Sarah King had a four-month concussion but never lost any memory. Did you have any mental deficits with it? Uh, it might have depended on where you had the bruise. Did you see stars for a month? Did you have trouble hearing? Uh, were you kind of out of balance for a month? What, uh, what effects did you have, if any, Sarah? That's pretty interesting. Okay. All right. But what I want the rest of you to know is to be able to understand the differences in memories and to know specifically that we've learned these from case studies of people with brain damage uh, um, or uh, memory deficits. And we sort of realize that there are different types 
of memory. And you know what? Beside episodic memory, I would even argue a third type of explicit memory called your self-memory. How many of you remember what your favorite ice cream flavor is? How many of you remember uh, uh, what your favorite pair of uh, uh, pants are? How many of you know your personality and can tell me whether or not you're extroverted or introverted? These are what we would call self-memories. And the reason I would say that they're a third type of mu memory is because here's the crazy thing. Most people that lose their episodic memory because of a concussion, they forget what they did over the last month, maybe, but they don't forget who they are. But there's a third type of amnesia called psychogenic amnesia. And this is usually only occurs to people who are undergoing severe stress. But some people actually forget their own identity. They forget who they are. I could wake up tomorrow and say, wow, who is that guy I'm looking at in the mirror? And this ha happens occasionally. It's called psychogenic amnesia. And occasionally, these people will go into fugue. It's called psychogenic amnesia with fugue. They will actually get on a bus and travel somewhere. So they forget who they are and they will then run along with it. So my wife might come home from work today and I might have disappeared. And she looks all over for me and calls her friends and, put, and calls the police. And for three months, the police look for me and I have just disappeared and they think somebody's killed me. And then all of a sudden, I turn up in Seattle, Washington, uh, using the name Ken Smith and working as a short order cook at a uh, Waffle House. And you might say, holy cow, what happened to Chris Roddenberry? Well, he's had a case of stress-induced psychogenic amnesia with few. He lost his identity and he actually traveled. Yes, Walter White, absolutely, William. There you go, right? Travel and change my identity. Although Walter White knew what he was doing and he was trying to avoid prison, right? Um, so Sarah King was nauseous and dizzy. I got hit in the ear across from the practice field by a football. Well, you know what? The ear around this area uh, is uh, your, your inner ear is where your balance uh, is, is controlled. So the fact that you were nauseous, maybe that swelling was pressing on the nerves going from your inner ear to your cerebellum, and that's what your effect was. That's kind of interesting, Sarah. I can't believe a football would do that. Uh, I guess if you got hit by the point and it was thrown hard. Hmm. Now, uh, one quick thing I do want to talk about. Uh, most of you, I do want you to know that your conscious memories are not exact replicas of the events that you experience. Most people think that memories are tape recorders. Memories are not tape recorders. If you think about why memory evolved, this will become obvious to you. Memory is not for the past. Memory is for the future. Memories allow you to decouple yourself from classical conditioning and to begin to form more complex associations and engage in more complex behaviors. If we're out on the Serengeti of Africa a million years ago and a lion attacks and kills my friend and I barely get away, I want to remember that scary creature and what it looks like. So next time I see it from 600 yards, I will know not to go near that creature because it'll kill me. Now, do I need to remember that exact lion? No. I just need to remember the general features of that lion. In fact, if my memory was too perfect and I was looking for a, a lion, a male lion with the big mane, I might miss the female lion that doesn't have a mane. So if you think about it, memories don't need to be perfect. And in fact, every time you see an object, you probably need to update that memory to make it uh, fit the new information that you have. So every time I see a different lion, my memory of what a lion is changes a little bit to incorporate 
that new lion. So think about memories. They are not for court systems. The court system is a very new invention where we want to know what you remember exactly. School, I want you to remember the muscles in the body exactly. That school is a very new invention. Memory was developed, memory evolved millions of years ago for other purposes. So memory was not designed to be perfect. Instead, memories sort of uh, are a general acorn. And whenever we bring the memory up, we add information into it. All of the times we've ever seen objects like that, we add into that kernel of a memory. So memory is not a tape recording. It's more of a reconstruction. Every time I think about my third birthday, my uh, third, fourth grade birthday party, and Stacy McCarver, my love from fourth grade changes just a little bit. That memory of what she said and what she did and how I felt changes a little bit. I, it's not a recording. Instead, it's a reconstruction, right? And so memory is not as accurate as we think. Now, how do we know this? And what are the demonstrations that have shown that memory is not like a JPEG, but is instead a Wikipedia page? Okay. Um, and I want to stop. Uh, Andrew Nicole says, psychogenic amnesia is also seen with dementia and onset Alzheimer's. Yes, absolutely, uh, 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 Andrea, although I don't know if we would, we wouldn't call it psychogenic amnesia. Psychogenic amnesia is usually reserved uh, for those cases where there is no organic brain damage. So we would still see a loss of the self and a loss of the ability to recognize the self, Andrea, but they would probably give it a different diagnosis since its root cause would be more organic than psychological. Does that make sense, Andrea? Okay. Now, here's the thing. These are the demonstrations that have shown why memory is not a JPEG, but more of a reconstruction. It turns out that people's memories tend to change to fit with their current beliefs or attitudes. So, um, I have a friend who was a uh, liberal uh, pot-smoking high school friend. And he did all kinds of crazy party animal kinds of things when he was 16. And he said all kinds of things about people and culture uh, when he was 16 or 17. My friend uh, then uh, became religious and became a uh, a priest after he got out of the military, a preacher, a Baptist preacher, after he got out of the Navy. And he has become incredibly conservative over the years. And now, as a 52-year-old man, just like me, he has a much different set of beliefs than he did when he was 16. And now, when I go back and tell him about some of the things that he said and he believed when he was 16, he calls me a liar. He laughs at me and says, I am completely mistaken. What has happened is his memory has changed to fit his current beliefs and attitudes. So there's no way he did that party thing. There's no way he said that party belief or that cultural belief back when he was 14 or 15 or 16. His memory has changed to fit his current beliefs. And you know what? To the degree that I have changed, I promise you my beliefs have changed to fit my current beliefs, if you will, right? And so all of us, as our attitudes and cultural styles change, our memories change to evolve to make us seem like we were always the person that we are now, okay? Now, here's the other thing. Uh, a lot of times, uh, well, there's this concept called infantile amnesia. It turns out that before about the age of three, uh, you do not have the neural matter and the 
parts of your brain are not myelinated enough to give you a real episodic memory. If you remember something that happened when you were 18 months old, it is a mismemory. You do not remember anything that happened before the age of three. If you have a memory from when you were two, it is a product of what we would call source misattribution. Sometimes people will tell us about a memory they had, and after a while, we will begin to think of it as our memory. Now, when you bring a memory up, like my fourth grade birthday party, okay, uh, I am recreating that memory in my mind. The weird thing is you can sometimes recreate a memory from somebody else's description and misattribute it to yourself. This is called source misattribution. And almost everybody who has a memory from when they were 18 months old or two months old, two years old, is experiencing source misattribution. You did something funny when you were 18 months old and your parents told it on told you about it on your third birthday. And then your parents told you about it on your fourth birthday party. And then every birthday party, your parents tell that funny story that happened on your second birthday party. And by the time you're nine years old, instead of just knowing you heard about what happened on your second birthday party, you actually think it happened. Okay? Now, here's the weird thing. Uh, good lawyers know that you can change somebody's memory based upon how you ask the question. And your book's going to talk about some research by a Harvard researcher named Elizabeth Loftus, who demonstrated that you can change people's minds if you, uh, depending on how you ask the question. So uh, she does this really cool experiment where she has people watch a videotape of a small fender bender, a small accident where there's no glass, just two cars bump into one another. She sends these people home, brings them back three days later, and she asks them a question. She says, how fast were the cars going when they? And she changes the question by one word. One third of the people, she said, how fast were the cars going when they bumped into one another? She asked another third, how fast were the cars going when they collided with one another? And she asked the third group, how fast were the cars going when they crashed into one another? And what she found is that people's estimate of how fast these cars were going changes based upon whether or not she uses the word bumped, collided, or smashed. She also asked them, do you remember seeing broken glass? And people are more likely to see, say they saw broken glass if the question, if they were asked whether or not they saw broken glass when the car smashed into one another. So, um, uh, so the way you're asked a question can affect the type of memory that you have. Um, and yes, in a sense, Sandra, what I want you to know is that your memory is not as perfect as you think it is. Sometimes it changed because your personality and your cultural beliefs changed. My cultural beliefs haven't changed as much, so I'm not going to be as big a product to memory bias as possible. However, there are lots of things that I was told about that I might not have actually experienced. So I, some of my memories are probably misattributed to other people's memories. And sometimes, depending upon how you ask me the question, I may have a different memory altogether. And this lady, Elizabeth Loftus, also found that you could plant false memories in people's minds. So what she would do is she would go, uh, bring adult people into their labs. Before she brought them into the lab, she would go talk to their family members and find a couple of stories from when they were children. They were young children. And she would bring them into the lab and she would say, hey, do you remember when you were three and you did X? And the person says, oh yeah, I remember that. She says, okay, do you remember when you were four and this happened and this really happened? And they said, oh yeah, I remember that too. She would say, all right, do you remember the time you were lost in a mall at the age of three and this stranger found you? And she finds that if she asked people about two things that happened to them that really happened to them when she was three, and then she asked them about a third thing that didn't happen, she can plant that false memory in their brain. And these people will say, yeah, I remember getting lost in a mall. 
So she found that not only can you frame the way a person remembers something based on how you ask them the question, but if you create the right situation, you can actually stick a fake memory in a person's head. So what I want you to know is that uh, there are strategies which you can use in school to plant memories in your head uh, as quickly and as accurately as possible. But most of the time, our and uh, the thing we in memory is a bunch of different things. And depending upon what activity or behavior or conscious thing we're doing, a different part of our brain is activated. And then the final lesson I wanted you to get today is though, however, most memories, most episodic memories are not real life pictures of what actually happened, but instead change every time you remember them. So you do not have as good a memory as you think you do. Okay? Did it, did it? No, that is not a dumb question at all, Sandra McConley. Okay? Hey, all right, so class is about over, and you know what? Look at that. Ryan Jarush, uh, another student from last semester, uh, uh, is in my class. Holy cow. Uh, Ryan, it, it's, it's good to see you. Ryan's from, uh, you are from uh, Palestine. He's my Palestinian friend uh, coming to visit. I hope everything's going well for you, Ryan. Thanks for stopping in and saying hello today. It's kind of weird. Uh, we had another student stop in earlier today, too. Oh, by the way, those of you that are coming to my class now, next semester, feel free to stop in and say hello to the class sometimes. I always love to have older students. I'm sorry, it was Lebanon. I'm sorry, it was Lebanon, not Palestine. I knew it was one of those two countries, bud. All right, folks. Well, hey, it's great to see you again here for Chapter uh, 7, Cognitive Psychology. Don't forget, there's a webinar tonight. We're going to learn the method of location and how to supercharge your memory so that you can learn things fast and efficiently. Uh, and uh, Ryan, I hope school's going well. Uh, send me an email. Let's get together sometime and uh, have a virtual cup of coffee, Ryan. I'd like to find out how classes are going for you this semester. Thank you very much. I appreciate that, buddy. Um, hey, folks, we are at the end of the broadcast. It's 957. Um, I just wanted to say it was great to see you. Thanks for asking a lot of good questions in the chat bar. Uh, Sandra, your question was not stupid. It was actually brilliant. My Wake Tech students are so smart. I hope to see you tonight at 7 o'clock in webinar. If you can't make it to webinar, make sure you do the discussion board so you get credit for this week's uh, a collaboration activity. Until I see you again, take care and have a great day. Thank you.